So thank you so much, Maharaj, for giving your valuable association and time. Now I would like to hand over the call to you, Maharaj. Thank you so much, Hare Krishna. Uh, you want to put the verse up on the board while I chant the invocation? <laughs> Om Gyan Timirandasya Gyan Ajana Salakaya Chaksun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guruvena Maha Shri Chaitanya Manobhistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine <clears throat> Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvishesa Sunyavari Astyatyane Satarine Vanchakalpa Tarubhischa Viva Sindhu Deva Chapatitanam Bhavne Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaha Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadar Har Shabhasani Gaur Bhakti Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. <clears throat> this is Srimad Bhagavatam 4, 4th Canto, 30th chapter, verse 38. Mayam tu shaksha bhagavam bhavasyam priyasya sakyu shana sangamena sudus chakir sasya bhavasya mityur Vishaktamam Tadya Gatim Gatasma. Translation Dear Lord, by virtue of a moment's association with Lord Shiva, who is, can't see it, it's blah. Go, go down a little, drop it down a little. Okay, my dear, that's good. Dear Lord, by virtue of a moment's association with Lord Shiva, who is very dear to you, and who is your most intimate friend, <clears throat> we were fortunate to attain you. You are the most expert physician capable of curing the incurable disease of material existence. On account of our great fortune, we have been able to take shelter at your lotus feet. So we will request one devotee who is very good at reading. Please uh, read for the benefit of everyone. Uh, Indu Mataji. Krishna Mataji. Mataji, can you be louder? Uh, Hare Krishna Mataji, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Purport. Uh, purport. By His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. It has been said, Harim Veena Na Mritim Taranti, without taking shelter of the lotus feet of the personality of Godhead, one cannot attain relief from the clutches of Maya, the repetition of birth, old age, disease, and death. The Prachetas receive the shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead by the grace of Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva is the Supreme de Devotee of Lord Vishnu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Vaishnava Nam Yathashambhu, the most exalted Vaishnava, is Lord Shiva. And those who are actually devotees of Lord Shiva follow Lord Shiva's advice and take shelter at the lotus feet of Lord Vishnu. The so-called devotees of Lord Shiva who are simply after material prosperity are in a way deceived by Lord Shiva. He does not actually deceive them because Lord Shiva has no business deceiving people, but because the so-called devotees of Lord Shiva want to be deceived Lord Shiva, who is very easily pleased, allows them all kinds of material benedictions. These benedictions might ironically result in the destruction of the so-called devotees. For instance, Ravana took all material benedictions from Lord Shiva, but the result was that he was ultimately destroyed with his family, kingdom, and everything else because he misused Lord Shiva's benediction. Because of his material power, he became very proud and puffed up. So he dared 
so that he dared kidnap the wife of Lord Ramachandra. In this way, he was ruined. To get material benedictions from Lord Shiva is not difficult, but actually these are not benedictions. The Prachetas receive benedictions from Lord Shiva and as a result, they attain the shelter of the lotus feet of Lord Vishnu. This is real benediction. The gopis also worship Lord Shiva in Vrindavan and the Lord is still staying there as Gopishwara. The gopis, however, prayed that Lord Shiva bless them by giving them Lord Krishna as their husband. There is no harm in worshiping the demigods, provided that one's aim is to return home, back to Godhead. Generally, people go to the demigods for material benefits, as indicated in Bhagavad Gita 7.20. Those whose minds are distorted by material desires surrender unto demigods and follow the particular rules and regulations for worship according to their own natures. One enamored by material benefits is called Hrita Jnana one who has lost his intelligence. In this connection, it is to be noted that sometimes in the revealed scriptures, Lord Shiva is described as being non-different from the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The point is that Lord Shiva and Lord Vishnu are so intimately connected that there is no difference in opinion. The actual fact is, Ekale Ishwara Krishna, Aras Sabha Britta, Britya. The only Supreme Master is Krishna, and all others are his devotees or servants. Chaitanya Charitamrita Adi Leela 5.142. This is the real fact. And there is no difference of opinion between Lord Shiva and Lord Vishnu in this connection. Nowhere in revealed, script, revealed scriptures that Lord Shiva claim to be equal to Lord Vishnu. This is simply the creation of the so-called devotees of Lord Shiva who claim that Lord Shiva and Lord Vishnu are one. This is strictly forbidden in the Vaishnava Tantra. Yastu Narayanam Devam, Lord Vishnu, Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma are intimately connected as master and servants. Shiva Virinchi Nutam, Vishnu is honored and offered obeisances by Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma. To consider that they are all equal is a great offense. They are all equal in the sense that Lord Vishnu is the Supreme Personality of Godhead and all others are his eternal servants. Hare Krishna. So we're getting a little insight in the relationship between Lord Vishnu and Lord Shiva, which we understand has always been a contention for spiritualists for many, many years. Uh, the contention is sometimes given some fuel by the Shastras itself, where the Shastras uh, also mm, glorify Lord Shiva as the Supreme Lord. But uh, it depends on what Shastra you hear. There are Shastras to get people who don't worship at all to worship, to begin worship, and therefore they can worship Lord Shiva because he gives them both, uh, he can give them uh, devotion to himself and at the same time he elevates them in a material way. But that is not the goal. It's simply a concession in order to get people from a lower standard of existence to a, a higher standard. But one has to understand that Lord Shiva and Lord Vishnu is compared, as it mentions in the, uh, in the Brahma Samhita, that just as you take milk and you put in a culture, you know, you add some culture and then you leave it in a certain temperature and after a while it becomes yogurt. So what is yogurt? Yogurt is nothing but milk. That's all it is. But it's in a different state. So in the same way, this comparison is very perfect because although there's no difference between Shiva and Vishnu. There is a difference. And the difference is that they have different functions. And also Shiva glorifies Lord Vishnu throughout his uh, prayers. There's a whole 
uh, section in the fourth canto also, prayers by Lord Shiva to Lord Vishnu. So uh, we have to understand that. People sometimes also say that, you know, that Ram, Ram worships Shiva during that uh, situation with Ravana. Ram worshiped Shiva in the sense that he honored Shiva as a great devotee of Ravana. I mean, Ravana, Ravana was killed by Ram in order to... Uh, Ravana was a Brahmana also. So Ravana took shelter of Lord Shiva. So in other words, Ram playing the part, now this is the important part, of, an, of, a, of a human being understood that I have killed a Brahmana. Because he was born in a Brahmin family. His father was, was Vishrava, a great Brahman. And therefore, in order to atone for my so-called sin, this is the Lord playing the part of an ordinary person, he worshipped the, the Brahm, uh, Ravana's guru, which was Lord Shiva. So people think, oh, well, this shows that actually uh, Shiva's more glorifier than Ram. But they don't understand the, the message coming from the Shastras. They have to hear the Shastras here from Guru. Unless you hear a Shastra from Guru, you can mistake, you can make so many mistakes in understanding and in application. Uh, Shiva is Vaishnavanam Yata Shambhu. He's the greatest of all Vaishnavas. So devotees honor Lord Shiva in the sense that we uh, pray to Lord Shiva to give us devotion to Lord Krishna. This is our, we also see how Lord Shiva is very instrumental in bringing people to Lord Vishnu or to Lord Krishna in devotion. Um, this, there's a whole history of devotees in our movement who, be, who before they came to Krishna consciousness were in some way or other worshiping Lord Shiva, on honoring Lord Shiva. And by doing that, they got the mercy of Shiva and therefore Shiva uh, gave, gave them a chance to come in contact with Lord Krishna. Uh, so this is quite common. There's many devotees like that who were honoring. So we, we give Shiva all honor. In fact, on Maha Shiva Ratri, um, we worship even the uh, cowherd boys, along with Nanda Maharaj, went to uh, uh, the place of worship for Lord Shiva on Mahavish on uh, Maha Shiva Ratri. And so it, there's an indication there that they honored Lord Shiva on that day. So uh, Shiva is very exalted. He's more powerful than Lord Brahma, although he comes from Lord Brahma. As it says that Brahma has 84% of the qualities of Lord Vishnu, but Shiva has, I mean, sorry, Brahma has 78% and um, Shiva has 84%. So Shiva is Trikala Gyan. He knows past, present, and future. Um, he is very powerful, but he can be worshiped in different ways. Some people worship him as the Supreme Lord. Some worship him as a, a person who gives material benedictions. Other worship him as, a demi, as demigods. But devotees honor and give all respects to Lord Shiva as one who is the best of all Vaishnavas. And that's mentioned in the Bhagavatam itself. In the, thir in the 13th chapter of, Shri, of the 12th canto, where it says, Nimda Ganga, Nama Ganga, uh, uh, what is it, Vaishnava Vajuta Vayam, Vaishnava Sarvatnam, what is that verse? Um, uh, I'll be, I'm going to get that verse. Nimda Ganga, Chika Chinam Ganga, Deva, uh, Deva Vayo Achuta Vayam, Vaishnavanam Yata Sundhu, Yata, um, what is it? Hmm. The last verse uh, glorifies the Srimad Bhagavatam. 
to the last line. I'm going to read that verse. Uh, give me a minute here and I'll find a verse and I'll read it for you because it's, it's such an important verse that we, we have to know this verse because it's so... Okay. So it says, Nimna Ganga Yata Ganga Devanam Machuta Yata Vaishnavanam Yata Shambhu Purana Puranayam Idam Ataha. Just as the Ganges is the greatest of all rivers, Lord, Chuta, Lord Achuta, the supreme among deities, and Lord Shambhu is the greatest of Vaishnavas, so Srimad Bhagavatam is the greatest of all Puranas. Glorifying Ganga, Krishna, Shiva, Bharata, like that. So this is a very, this, this verse really puts Shiva in the perspective that he is. So we've sometimes we pray to Shiva, we honor Shiva, like that, in order to get his mercy. He is very merciful. He's also called the father of all living entities. Um, he also has the power of the super soul in the sense that he, he knows the hearts of all living entities. This is the power of Lord Shiva. Uh, when uh, creation unfolded and the Mahavishnu appeared in order to bring the next manifestation of creation, the material elements were in a aggregate form. In other words, all the ingredients that make up the material energy were in an egg-shaped form, which is called pradhan. Pradhan means they're all there, the 24 elements, but they are not active. So in order to activate the elements, the Lord glanced over the elements, and that glance is Shiva. In that glance, there is three qualities. There is Shiva, is the glance, and inside the glance, there is the living entities and the time factor. So this is how creation unfolds. That's why Shiva is given the position of father of all living entities, because with the help of Lord Shiva, Lord Vishnu brought about the creation. Of course, once the elements are activated, Brahma appears and starts to formulate the different bodies in order for the living entities to come out for their next manifestation in the material existence. So she was very diverse, very powerful, very uh, complex. Complex is a very good word because he, he plays so many different roles. And therefore, but we, the devotees, understand, according to Shastra, that he, he is the best of all Vaishnavas. And therefore, we can honor Lord Shiva in that way. And we do. Uh, Shiva is very dear to the devotees, and devotees are very dear to Shiva. Okay, so um, I think I'm supposed to speak about Gita Jayanti too. Is that correct? Yes, Maharaj. Um, yeah. Well, is, is, before I begin Gita Jayanti, is there any questions related to the verse? Krishna Maharaj, Dantavat Pranam, thank you so much for such a wonderful class. Uh, Maharaj, I do have one question on, uh, so we say uh, Shiva is uh, definitely the greatest devotee and uh, he is the transformation of uh, Lord Vishnu, but uh, how is the, the Rudra that appears from Lord Brahma, how is uh, he the same as Shiva or well, Rudra is the the uh, the manifestation of Shiva for destruction, and Shiva is also he is the deity in the charge of the mode of ignorance. So, in that charge of the mode of ignorance, he manifests his forms in order for the destruction of the 
creation. And then that puts everything into the interim form and then waiting for the next manifestation of creation. So Rudra, yeah, there are 11 Rudras, so they all have particular names and they all have particular relationships. So Rudra, as is explained in the third canto, came from the anger of Lord Brahma when the four Kumaras refused Lord Brahma's uh, direction. He became angry at them and then Rudra appeared. So that, that Rudra manifestation of Shiva was Shiva's appearance in this particular manifestation. So he's the anger of Lord Shiva, because Shiva's asutos, he's easily pleased and easily angered. So he can get angry quite fast, and he can also show favor very quickly also. So that's one of his characteristics. Okay. So that manifestation of Sh Shiva in his form of anger, especially for the destruction, is the Rudra manifestation. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for the detailed explanation. Yeah, that's explained in the third canto, I think in the 11th or 12th chapter of the third canto. We'll find all that in yes. detail. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Should we go on to Gita Jayanti? Uh, Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to Your Holiness. Thank you for this wonderful class on uh, Lord Shiva. Would you be so kind as to tell us where we can read a little bit more about that glance which you mentioned? It was a little quick for me and I couldn't quite grasp it about that glance of Lord Shiva. Is that correct? Yeah, and that's mostly in the Brahma's Samhita. So, is, which is the glance of the Lord over material nature? Is it different from this glance of Lord Shiva? No, that's not, not the glance of Lord Shiva. The glance of Vishnu is, is Shiva. Oh, okay. He's called Sadashiva, the original Shiva. So, the glance carries Lord Shiva and the living entities. Is that correct? And, and the time factor. Okay. Thank you. And it's carried by Rama Devi. Rama Devi is the consort of Mahavishnu. She carries that glance because uh, the Lord's glance never never touches the material energy. That's why Shiva is there, is the intermediate, because he touches the material energy through through Mahavishnu. But the glance is carried by Rama Devi. Rama Devi is an, an expansion of uh, uh, Mahalakshmi. Okay, so today is a very glorious day. Once a year we honor the speaking of the Bhagavad Gita by Lord Sri Krishna, 700 verses. The, the Gita is the uh, treatise by which one can understand the process of bhakti. The Gita was spoken on the battlefield to the disciple of the Lord known as Arjuna, who was a Kshatriya. Uh, the speaking of the Gita is the uh, historical uh, pillar by which we understand uh, the nature of the Lord. Yada yada hitarmasya glanir bhavati bharatas. And he comes whenever there is discrepancy. Glani. Glani means discrepancy. Discrepancy, 
discrepancy. Yeah, discrepancy in the uh, execution of moral and religious principles within the world. So the Lord comes. So the Lord appeared 5,000 years ago to realign the living entities' activities in, towards the mood of devotion by establishing the saintly kings in, in the world. And that saintly king, of course, was King Yudhisthira. So the Lord, in order to do that, he had to convince a person who was not convinced about his role in bringing about religious principles. The war, the battle of Kurukshetra was a necessary uh, result of all other forms of uh, uh, attempt to bring about peace in the world between two families who are of the same family, the Kurus and the Pandavas. And it was about ruling the world. <clears throat> so everything the Lord did to bring about peace was rejected. So ultimately, the battle of Kurukshetra was the, the last resort. Some people think, well, that was the first, re no, actually the Lord tried to do everything he could along with uh, other personalities who assisted him to bring about peace, but it never worked. <clears throat> so you see, this is a, actually a principle when there's nothing left and when religion goes down, then there is a conflict between the saintly and the unsaintly, or the, the suras and the suras. And that's going on today also. The world is also undergoing a pretty difficult time. In fact, uh, it's one of the more difficult times in history right now. We're in a very, not because of the, because of the, uh, uh, the COVID virus, but because of the results of sinful activities are permeating the planet. And therefore, in order to square up the reactions, uh, a, uh, a pandemic was released. Uh, these are reactions to sinful activities. So that was there a little more than 5,000 years ago. There were a lot of avaricious kings. In fact, when the battle began, uh, 18 Oxyhini divisions, divisions were on the side of the Kurus and only 12 on the side of the Pandavas. So most of the kings lined up against Krishna and the Pandavas just to show what the nature of the world was. There was a lot of avaricious kings. And uh, there's a long history that brought about that that. Uh, unsaintly rule in the world. But the interesting point is that uh, Arjuna, he is Krishna's representative to bring about spiritual principles. He doesn't want to follow the Lord's instructions. He's a Kshatriya and his duty is to fight on religious principles. In other words, give protection to the innocent and help to establish saintly rule in the world. But the reason why he refused is that because he noticed on the other side, the persons he is meant to fight against were people who were very dear to him. Relatives, friends, well-wishers, teachers, people he grew up with, people he had very genuine affection for and regard for. So after seeing that, he fell into the bodily conception of life, seeing that this how can I do this? And he gave many reasons why he couldn't do it. He, in fact, the whole first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, you see Arjuna is giving so many reasons why he can't fight. And what are those reasons? Well, he says, you know, how can we enjoy the, the rule of the kingdom when it's being uh, gotten by the spoils of others. In other words, it's tainted by blood. How can we enjoy the kingdom 
when it's at the expense of those who are very dear to us. And then, of course, he also said that, you know, on the battlefield, there was, uh, this was the greatest war in the history of wars. There were just the amount of soldiers were killed where 640 million soldiers were killed. And of course, many other millions of soldiers were not killed. So there was just a huge amount of military uh, assembly. It took up miles and miles of ground. Just, just the soldiers lining up. You can go to that area today and you can see the area of the battlefield, how, how extensive it was. It, it was. it was huge. It was, I don't know exactly how many, but it was more than 20 miles of area. And so Arjuna now has <clears throat> concluded that I'm not going to fight after giving all his reasons. Krishna, he's patient. He's listening. He's on the chariot. He's agreed to be the charioteer of Arjun, but now Arjun doesn't want to fight. So Krishna knows everything. So Krishna begins to enlighten Arjun. But before he could enlighten Arjun, Arjun had to come to a certain stage when he realized this is important. This is a principle that we can follow in our own Krishna consciousness that he realized, I am helpless. I cannot figure out what I'm supposed to do or what I'm not supposed to do. I don't know. And he was overwhelmed with lamentation. His bow slipped from his hand. He, he couldn't fight. He was, he was distraught in the real sense of the word. But then, then he, he wakened up. Krishna inspired him to think of something and he thought of the right thing. He said, now I can understand only by your mercy. Therefore, I'm a soul surrender unto you. Please enlighten me. Then Krishna understood. Oh, now he's ready to hear. So in our practice of Krishna consciousness, we have to be ready to, to hear. If we're not ready to hear, even if we hear, it won't go to the heart. It won't awaken the knowledge that it's meant to wake, awaken. So one has to be ready to give oral submission to the authorities which can enlighten one on how to progress on the path back home, back to Godhead. So when Arjun finally understood his situation and Krishna understood that he understood Krishna smiled and then he began. And what is the first thing he said? He didn't say congratulations, you know, you, you finally understood. He didn't say that. He said, Asochan of Asochan's twam, Pratyavaram Chibashise, Gatusums Agudatsums Cha, Nanu Shochandi Panditaha. You're speaking nice words, Arjuna. I must say, but I have to conclude, everything you're said is foolish. No intelligent people, person speaks like you. In other words, pretty much he put him, he came, he came down pretty heavy on him. <laughs> Arjuna was ready for that. And then Krishna enlightened him. The Tvevam, the Tvevam Ham Jatunasam, the Tvam Neme Janaripa, the Chaiva Bhavishyama Sarvadaya Dhaparam. Never was a time that I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings on the battlefield, nor in the free future, so any of us cease to be. We are eternal. And then Krishna begins to describe the difference between the body and the soul, between matter and spirit, between what is eternal and what is temporary. And then Arjuna is in the position to hear. And so for 700 verses, this entire Bhagavad Gita covers the one, one of the most important subject matters 
in, in the history of subject matters, what is our relationship with the Lord and how to uh, connect to that relationship and how to achieve the benefit of that relationship, which is pure devotion to the Lord. So Bhagavad Gita is a great treatise uh, around the world today. Devotees are speaking about it, glorifying it, chanting the verses, having uh, yagyas in honor of Bhagavad Gita. So many things. But Bhagavad Gita it should be a daily affair. It's not something we do once a year. It's something that we should constantly refer to, read, and understand. There are, there are many people who take lifetime vows as soon as they begin to read Bhagavad Gita, the entire, the entire 700 verses daily as a regular feature of austerity, just reading it. And so we have this great, uh, powerful scripture spoken by the Lord of himself. It's called Gita Upanishads. It is so powerful that it's given the same name as the Upanishads because the Upanishads are the Shrutis and the Shrutis are the Vedas. Although Gita is Smriti, it's been, it's been elevated to the Upanishads. It's called Gita, Gita Upanishad, like that. So it's glorious. And there, throughout the history of the world, Lord Shiva, he's one of them. He glorifies the Gita in so many beautiful ways. Uh, he says that uh, the, the information of the Gita is like milk and the knowledge is like a cow and Krishna is like the cowherd boy and Arjuna is like the uh, is like the uh, person receiving the, uh, the milk he's the calf so Krishna is milking and giving the milk to the calf and the calf is drinking it so that milk is the knowledge of transcendence so Gita is glorious in all sense of the word. It contains three categories within itself, Jnana Yoga, Karma Yoga, and Bhakti Yoga. The first six chapters are Karma Yoga, or at least they emphasize Karma Yoga. yoga. They're not exclusively Karma Yoga, but they're, they emphasize Karma Yoga. The second six chapters emphasize Bhakti, and the third Six chapters emphasize Jnana Yoga. But Krishna at the very end uh, concludes by saying, uh, always think of me, become my devotee, worship me and offer your homage unto me. Surely you'll come to me. I, I promise you this. He, he says, I promise you'll come to me if you do these four things. Worship the Lord, remember the Lord, uh, offer obeisances to the Lord and become the devotee of the Lord. These four things make up the entire process of bhakti yoga. And then Krishna in the next verse says, Sarva Dharma Pradiksha Jamma Me Kam Saranam Vaja Aham Tvam Sarva Pape Bhyo Moksha Yishyami Ma Suchaha Abandon all ideas on how you can make advancement that's what it means when he says abandon all religion, abandon all forms of religion. What does he mean by that? That's explained by the Acharyas. Give up your own ideas. You have so many ideas. You think by yoga, by chanting mantras, by doing this, by doing that, by elevate, by performing austerities, by, by doing various types of pujas. You think, oh, this, is, well, this will get me success. Krishna says, forget all that, just surrender to me. And if you surrender to me, then the path of bhakti becomes blessed by the mercy of the Lord and becomes, what we say, easily traversed. And the Lord is bringing us to the point of surrender because without surrender, one cannot submissively imbibe this knowledge. And that's what Arjuna, he came, he came to be 
refusing everything to Krishna and then gradually his consciousness was being transformed where he came he said now I'm a soul surrender to you please instruction now I'm ready to fight on your behalf on religious principles so he went to a very morose situation to a very enthusiastic mood of devotion so if we hear Bhagavad Gita regularly in that mood of submission, we will understand everything about Krishna, about devotional service, about our relationship with Krishna, and how to make progress back home, back to Godhead. As Prabhupada said, Bhagavad Gita, and he added Srimad Bhagavatam, both of these scriptures are sufficient for God realization in this age. Both of these scriptures are needed. So we have both. Bhagavad Gita is complete, but is complete in the preliminary and the higher knowledge of, of the relationship with the soul to Krishna is given in the Srimad Bhagavatam. But Krishna in the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam takes the same principles that he taught to Arjuna and reteaches them to uh, Uddhava, his very dear friend. And he takes that same teachings, but he brings them on a higher level. So knowledge is power. Knowledge is freedom. When you have knowledge, you're free. And what is the basic principle of knowledge? I'm not this body. Until we come to the point of understanding I'm not this body, we remain trapped in this cycle of birth and death. And we remain trapped into the, illu the illusion that I can find happiness through the senses and mind and the material energy. So this is the, the principle of knowledge where it frees you from illusion. Illusion causes suffering. When you understand who you are and what is your activities, nothing can hurt you. Even death cannot, cannot affect you because you, you realize that I'm a soul, pure soul. And even if I have to leave this body for some reason, which I, we all have to do, that is inevitable, then I go to a better place and hopefully I go back home, back to Godhead. So this knowledge is uh, freedom, it's happiness, it's uh, everything that is auspicious comes by way of transcendental knowledge. And it's a sword that cuts through the illusion of material existence. So this Bhagavad Gita is the uh, end. We see in the world today, people uh, are making Bhagavad Gita more and more regular. Srila Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita has sold uh, uh, tens and millions of copies that's being reprinted I guess for like I don't know the 20th printing or so much it's, and each printing has something like 60 70,000 copies so Bhagavad Gita is still going out still waking up people to the truth of how one can stop their suffering in this world and attain pure love. That love is natural, but nobody can find it. It's interesting. You know, there's an animal called a deer. Everyone knows a deer. And there's a kind of deer that's called a musk deer. The musk deer has a aroma about them and that aroma is coming from the body of the deer. But the deer smells the aroma from its own body and starts looking for it. And the deer is going here and there trying to find that aroma coming in contact. He doesn't know that the aroma is coming from his own body. So in the same way, the living entities don't know that the happiness they're looking for is right within their own self. And so this knowledge awakens that happiness, gives one a uh, uh, clear vision on how to live life and achieve the goal of life, which is love of God. 
So today, we should, everyone should read the Bhagavad Gita at least once, all the verses. It's a very uh, much a part of today's ceremony. Where I am here in uh, Ljubljana, we're going to be doing a two-hour yajna, starting at uh, 3.30 our time, which is uh, 2.30 UK time. And we'll be doing a two-hour yajna in honor of the Bhagavad Gita, and we'll be reciting Bhagavad Gita continuously throughout the day. So yeah. It's a way to honor Bhagavad Gita. It's, uh, it's the way to honor the speaker of Bhagavad Gita. Prabhupada wanted to build a temple in that area where Krishna spoke Bhagavad Gita. He wanted to get that land. That was one of the things we were not able to do. It was hard. Prabhupada had plans to get a land and build a huge temple and I called it the Krishna Arjun Temple. But we were lucky enough to be able to establish a monument there on the land, which has Krishna and Arjuna on the chariot. It's in a glass surrounding, I think. But we weren't able to get the land, although Prabhupada tried because it was very hard, because everyone knew the value of that place. Okay, so this is a little bit about the glories of Bhagavad Gita. And each of the chapters are full of transcendental knowledge, transcendental uh, bliss. Any questions, comments, realizations? Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you so much for enlightening us. Thank you so much for uh, reminding us what should be our mood to read Bhagavad Gita because it's very much important and uh, by telling that uh, by reading and hearing this uh, knowledge of Bhagavad Gita we can attain the ultimate destination so thank you so much Maharaj for enlightening us every Friday so now I will request devotees if they have any questions they can ask now Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. I um, Hare Krishna. I don't have a question, but I just wanted to say thank you so very much for your explanation of Gita Jayanti. It was such a beautiful explanation, and I, I'm hoping to share it with many friends. It was very, it was just inspiring and lovely. So thank you, Hare Krishna. Thank you, thank you very much. My my obeisance is to you. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisance with all glory to Shri Prabhupada. Thank you so much for the wonderful class and uh, thank you for speaking about uh, Advent of Bhagavad Gita. Um, uh, yes, Maharaj, uh, we should read Bhagavad Gita, all the shlokas um, this, uh, today. So we have arranged the program right, you know, after almost uh, two hours, you know. It's, I'll see, it's, uh, it's 10 o'clock here, EST. I don't know what time at the at your place, but um, we will be reading all the shlokas today. On nice, time. very nice. Yeah. Uh, what time do you start? Uh, 10 o'clock EST, see, uh, almost two hours from now. Okay. Earlier than that. Okay, good. Um, I think I'll be in the middle of our yagya at that time, but we, I'm sure you'll have a a transcendental experience just by reading it it uh, has such power what to speak of practicing it yes Maharaj. yeah it's uh, someone is asking is this the same link yes it's the same link and uh, timing is um, yeah yeah 
10 o'clock in Eastern time. Eastern time, 10 o'clock. We had, had five hours for UK, so it's about three o'clock yeah, UK o time. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. hmm. Thank you. Tell us to finish on the chapter. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you for the class. Thank you for coming. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, please accept uh, uh, my respectful obeisances. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Very, very wonderful, concise, and uh, a pristine explanation of Bhagavad Gita, the importance of it, and, uh, and how uh, uh, it solves the dilemma of everyone, like how. Um, Bhagavad Gita solved the dilemma of Arjuna. Thank you so much. Uh, so, um, Maharaj, my question is, I have seen many uh, devotees uh, ha have some tips how they read Bhagavad Gita every day to keep in touch with uh, Bhagavad Gita. So, is there anything that you can tell us uh, how we can... Uh, you know, there are so many things, Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charita Amrita, but uh, I still uh, feel from my own point of view that this is the basis and we need to keep in touch uh, with the concepts in Bhagavad Gita and so many things from Bhagavad Gita to learn and understand and apply. So how to, uh, uh, I mean, can you guide us how we can uh, keep in touch with Bhagavad Gita every single day? <laughs> Okay, so yeah, so every day, chapter by chapter, go into each of the chapters and uh, pick out a verse from the first chapter, start off with the first chapter, and read that verse, and read the purport. Think about it, try to understand it. And you may also hear from uh, the Acharyas on the comments. So, and then go do one verse a day from every chapter, or if you want to do it, actually what you can do is just systematically go through the Bhagavad Gita verse by verse and read. And then when something outstanding comes the something that really hits you you can stop there read it think about it discuss it with other devotees if it's possible uh, there is a beautiful book written by uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur which is the you know, the entire commentary on Bhagavad Gita um, and there's there are actually many commentaries on Bhagavad Gita so many so I find reading the scripture is interesting and thinking about it. But then again, I go to the Acharyas to get their, uh, you know, elevated understanding of the more finer points of the verses. So we could, we could come up with a particular routine where we every day read a verse or read a few verses and discuss it or Try to understand it, hear from the common, hear from the acharyas about the section we're reading. Thank you so much, Mother. That's one way. <laughs> Thank you so much, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj, um, uh, many devotees they read chapter a day and it's like some, some they, they just read the shloka and some they just read the translation. Yeah. But is it, uh, yeah, is it, you know, uh, is, uh, do we have to read uh, purport also every day? That's up to you. If you want to, you can. There's benefit in doing that, but 
if you find the time is not available, then uh, read the verses. Or what I recommend to my disciples when they come to me, I say, read, read one chapter of Bhagavad Gita every day, just, just, to, just the translation. And if you want, you know, it's not like you can't read the purports, but if you have time, read them also. It depends how you want to proceed. You can do it in a more general way, or you can do it in a more stu studious way by studying what you read. But uh, you have to find out what, what works for you in based on the time you have available. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, like, uh, sometimes we find it difficult to read the verses or some of the devotees are not well versed in uh, reading the verses. So translation, we can read the translation. Of yeah. The... yeah, that's fine. Okay. But the Sanskrit is very beautiful, very melodious. Once you start chanting the Sanskrit verses, you look forward to doing that. It's like pure poetry from the Sanskrit. Why not take time out and try to learn how to pronounce the Sanskrit? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. I, I just want Hare. to... I don't know if you can hear. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Uh, how do you go? Uh, yeah. yeah. You need to turn up your volume a little. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's all the way. I'm going closer. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, what I have learned that it's very nice to uh, when go back to the end of the Bhagavad Gita and they have a diacritical mark and how to pronounce this, all the Sanskrit uh, words and letters. Yeah. So it's a very nice guide to pronounce it. So then if we learn that, it doesn't take so much time. But just in the beginning, it may take like little time, but then we can just learn one diacritic at a the time, then do it on another one and then another one and like, then it will be very nice and beautiful. And we can- Yeah, you're getting the, the, you're getting the knowledge directly from the way it was presented. Thank you, Manas. Sanskrit is so beautiful. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare um, I have a question other than from Gita Jayanti. Um, okay. So in the Mahabharata, when Yudhishthira was told to tell a lie um, to Drona that Ashutama was dead, why did he, um, like, why did his chariot stop floating and fall on the ground? Because he, he hesitated. Yeah, he hesitated. Thank you, Maharaj. He's thinking, he's thinking, I can't tell a lie. He hesitated. He doubted Krishna. Thank you, Mr. Jyoti. Oh, sorry, that's, it's actually Rohan. Oh, that's my mom. Oh, Rohan. Said. Oh, yeah, oh, Jyoti is a girl's name. Yeah. <laughs> She's the son of Jyoti Mataji. She's from Charlotte. Um, you okay. might know her. She's from Charlotte. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Chariots touch the ground and we don't follow Krishna's words. <laughs> Hard. Our chariot, will also, our old chariot will also hit the ground. <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj. Can I ask a question which is not related to today's class, but for the, um, uh, again, related to Mahabharata? 
Of course, yeah. So uh, we know uh, Bhishma Pitama waited for uh, Uttarayan to start, sun to come in the northern hemisphere. But then the war was conducted in the time when sun was in the south. And that is not considered auspicious. But then why did they choose the time to start uh, the great war in the time when they knew that millions of people will die, but then it is in the inauspicious <laughs> time? <laughs> I could expect a question like that from you. You, you want to make things very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> One of those questions where you have to actually, you know, do like research for the next 10 years to find the answer. <laughs> what? I mean, <laughs> but the thing is, here's the point, and I got the answer. Somehow I got it. Krishna was there. Yes. And because Krishna was there, those who died on the battlefield got auspicious you know, destination of Krishna. Yes, maybe. Bhishma Dev was just following the certain principle, that's all. The reason why he took that time to stay there was to enlighten uh, Yudhisthira in the knowledge. He spoke how to govern the, how to govern the kingdom. And everyone listened for those, I think, I don't know how many days it was. Um, but yeah, so he just took the opportunity to leave at the most auspicious time. But at the same time, everyone who died on the battlefield, you know, those who saw Krishna or those who were killed by Arjuna, he got a, got a great destination. Yes, they all got liberated and because Krishna's presence was there, it was all auspicious. But then Pishma Pitama, the second explanation what you gave is making more sense now to me because he took that opportunity to teach Yudhishthira about how to govern. So that was a good uh, explanation, Marak. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's, that's in the Bhagavatam. <laughs> Thank you. Any more difficult questions? No, Marak, I didn't want to make <laughs> This has been bothering me for quite some time. So I was, I felt this, uh, you are the right person to answer me that. <laughs> you can bother me. I, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, these challenging questions are good because they make you, they force you to think. <laughs> Good, good, good. Okay. So, uh, any more questions? I'm ready. Uh, Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances again. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to your holiness. In this uh, war between the Kauravas and the Pandavas, uh, Dronacharya, who was the learned teacher, who knew the Shastras, took the side of the Kauravas. Bhishma Dev, who was also equally learned, took the side of the Kauravas. Why did this happen? That in spite because, because they were supported by Diyodhana. They felt obliged to Diyodhana because he was, he was maintaining them. Both of them. That was the reason. But I'll give you another example. I'll give you the, the hidden reason why Bhishma Dev took the side of the Kauravas. This is the this is the internal reason. The internal reason was, and this is a message which is for all times, that no matter how powerful you are, no matter how great you are, no matter how you know in all sense of the word, you know, great, powerful in all sense, if you're against Krishna, you're gonna lose. That was the point. That's why he wanted to show that nobody could defeat Bhishma. Bhishma could have killed a whole Pandavan army by himself. 
alone. He had that power. And he was invincible because he couldn't die unless he wanted to die. He had that benediction. But in order to show that anyone's against the Supreme Personality of Godhead, even me will be defeated. That's the internal reason. And that's brought out by the Acharyas. The external reason was he was maintained by Dodi Deodhana. So the internal reason is the actual reason. Maharaj, was there any other external reason? Like he had taken a vow to support the king who is sitting on a throne there, like? Yeah, that was also there. But the Diodna uh, was ma maintaining Bhishma Dev. Bhishma Dev didn't have any kingdom. He was a Kshatriya. He was a king. But he didn't have anything to rule. So the Diodna really was kind to him, but he was kind in a, in a, uh, in a self-interested way. He did everything for Grandfather Bhishma to give him everything he wanted and needed. So he could use Grandfather Bhishma for whatever he needed when, when the time came. The Yodana was very diplomatic, very diplomatic. He was, he's the, he was the emblem of diplomacy. He knew how to get people to do things for him. He was expert at that. Yeah, another example is Karuna, where he actually influenced Karuna's behavior by just doing that trick in the early days. Mm -hmm. In fact, he even tried to get Krishna on his side. Yeah, he came to Krishna to, you know, to get Krishna on his side. And Krishna was sleeping. And he knew Arjun was going to come also. So he decided to get there before. So when he got there, Krishna was resting. So he stood next to Krishna's bed at the head where Krishna was sleeping. But Arjuna had arrived at the same little laughter. And when Krishna woke up, he saw Arjuna first. Then he saw Duryodhana. So Duryodhana said, well, I came first. You know, I have a chance. I should ask you first for a favor. Because Krishna was willing to give each of them a blessing. But uh, Krishna said, no, you came first, but I saw Arjuna first. So Arjuna has first choice. So Arjuna understood the position of Krishna. So he said, and Krishna offered, one of you can have my armies, the Narayani, Sena armies, that they were called Narayani Sena, powerful armies, and the other ones can have me. But those who choose me, I'm not fighting. So Arjuna had the first choice, and he took Krishna. Uh, Diodana was dancing in ecstasy. He was thinking, what a fool Arjuna is. I get all the armies, and you get Krishna, and he's not even going to fight. What's the use? So our Diodana remained quiet, but at the same time, he was ec ecstatic. But he came to Krishna to get a benediction. And so he received the armies and that's exactly what he wanted. But as, but as proven by Bhishma Dev, if you're against Krishna, it doesn't matter, you lose. <laughs> And that's, that's, that's a message for all of us. As long as we stay fixed in our Krishna consciousness, everything will turn out glorious by the arrangement of the Lord. Time and truth are, are, are uh, marriageable partners. Time and truth go together. So in, tr in time, truth prevails. The truth is that the last, the last verse in the Bhagavad Gita, I don't remember the exact, wherever there is Krishna, the master of all mix, mystics, wherever there is Arjuna, the supreme archer, I, Sanjaya says it, there will be morality, victory, 
extraordinary power and opulence. So wherever there is God and his pure devotee, everything is powerful. You have to go up a little more. Can't see the whole thing. There you go. Wherever there's Krishna, the master of mystics, and wherever there is Arjuna, the supreme archer, there will also certainly be opulence, um, uh, opulence, victory, extraordinary power, and morality. That is my opinion. And that opinion is fact, it's not just an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> so we stay strong in our Krishna consciousness, stay fixed despite whatever happens materially. This is very important. There will be difficulties in the material world. The material world is full of difficulties. There will be so many calamities. Just stay fixed in your Krishna consciousness despite whatever happens. And in the end, you'll be victorious. What is that victory? You'll go back to Godhead. The material energy will keep changing, 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 changing. But devotee stays fixed in their duty. Okay, should we end here? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you. So may, thank everyone, you. may everyone dive deeply into the glories of Bhagavad Gita, especially today, and uh, have a transcendental, ecstatic experience. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Thank you so much, Maharaj. So, uh, thank you everyone for joining. So, we can offer obeisances. Vancham Kalta Rubishi Kapa Sindhu Evcha Katita Nam Pavne Dho Vesha Vedyo Namo Namo Anand Koti Vesha Vendiki Jai Shri La Prabhu Padiki Jai Shri La Prabhu Padiki Jai Oh, His Holiness Chandmali Swami Maharaj Ki Jai. Jai. Thank you so much Maharaj Jai. Thank you so much Maharaj Krishna. Thank you very much Gurudev Happy Gita Jai